Welcome to our Common Core Forum. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? My name is Jennifer Reynolds. I am the creator of Arizona's Against Common Core. I'm just like you. Uh, some people like calling me the chief fighting against Common Core, but I like to think of myself as a mother just like all of you. I found out about Common Core a few years ago when my fourth grade son started bringing home this crazy man. And my husband and I are both engineers, and we were dumbfounded. Why are you doing math in this crazy way? Looking out in matrices and things like this. Why aren't you using the stacking method, the algorithms that we learned? Because you already know your multiplication tables. He was very frustrated, so I took it to the school level, to the school board level. And then I started following the superintendent who can tell around asking him the questions, because I wasn't getting the answers at the local level. Because of these investigations, I finally realized, you know what? I bet you there's a lot of moms out there like me that don't know a lot about common core too. So that's when I started the website and here we are today. We've had lots of successes. Our membership has grown extensively. Due to our grassroots efforts and testifying the legislature, we had six bills last year, one of which was, went all the way up to the governor's desk. She vetoed it. She said it was redundant and not necessary. It was House Bill 2316. I don't know how protecting student privacy and the future of our children and protecting our state's rights is redundant and not necessary. But, so I wanted to have this event tonight to educate all of you more on Common Core standards. We have our leading experts in the nation here, Dr. Stotsky, uh, Dr. Milgram, Zia Lorman, and we also have two local candidates who I think are our best solution right now to driving out Common Core from our state. Uh, our Senate President, Andrew Biggs, has graciously agreed to be our moderator tonight. I wanted to give a little brief bio on him. I know I'm not going to do justice, so I apologize, Andy, if I've forgotten anything. Uh, Andy Vegas is a native of Arizona, and he's a lawyer. We all kind of groan when we hear the word lawyer, but he's, I would call, a constitutional lawyer. He, has, he can practice law here in Arizona, Washington, and also in New Mexico, and he did uh, practice law in New Mexico for a few years. He served in our House of Representatives. He got interested in politics. I've read some of the interesting articles about him on how they were always talking politics as kids, but he joined one of the local uh, district meetings one night and became fascinated by politics, as I did, and that's when he started getting involved. He was elected into the House of Representatives here in the state and served for eight years, and he also recently was elected into the Senate. He was chair of the Appropriations Committee, and he was also the Vice Chairman of the Government Reform and Judiciary Committee. He currently now has, has a position of Senate President, and he's been doing a fabulous job. He's been called the champion of this taxpayer by the Americans for Prosperity, and he's been honored numerous times by the Goldwater Institute for, as a friend of liberty. Many of you don't know, but he's authored many books as well, and my most favorite is called The Doctrine of Liberty. So I want to turn the time over to Senate President Andy Biggs. The way this forum is going to run, He's going to be our moderator. We're going to have each one of our speakers. As you look at the biography sheet, we're going to go down the list. He's going to introduce each one of our speakers. They're going to speak for approximately 20 minutes. He's going to introduce the next speaker. We're going to go through all of them. And then at the end, I'm going to be collecting question cards from you. I have a basket on the floor here where I'm going to be walking around collecting question cards. And he's, I'm going to send those up to him, and he's going to moderate, and we're going to try to bring them together, which questions are similar, which ones aren't, and we'll go for it that way. So please, while we're, the other presenters are doing their presentations, please fill out your question cards. That way, when it's time for Q&A, you can already have those filled out. I would really appreciate that. So I now ask you to give a warm welcome to our Common Core speakers tonight, and I'll turn it over to the Senate President today. Thank you, Jim, for coming very much, and thank, I appreciate each one of you being here tonight. I'm grateful to see a good crowd. I know it looks like it's going to be stormy outside, and uh, so I hope that everybody will brave the storm and come tonight. So I'm glad to have you here. Uh, I just want to mention a couple folks here. Uh, we have Senate State Senator Judy Burgess here. She's the Transportation Chairman. She's come all the way from West Side. So welcome, Judy. Uh, Secretary of State and Gubernatorial Candidate Ken Bennett is here with us tonight. Senator State Senator of State, 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 uh, State Majority Leader Thayer Vashur is here. He's, uh, he, he's waving to me. So uh, I'm going to thank you. And then, uh, and then we, of course, have uh, Diane Douglas and Frank Briggs here. 
And I want to just tell you, how, I want to remind you of a couple things. Please fill out your questions uh, as, you, uh, as you're listening to the speakers tonight so we can have a good, robust question and answer period uh, after they've made their presentations. The second thing uh, I will do is, and I just did it myself, is if you wouldn't mind putting your uh, cell phones either to off or to vibrate, that would be really helpful. We, uh, in the state legislature, just almost a year ago, we had a, uh, a big forum so that we could discuss Common Core. And out of that forum came six bills. Not all of them made it to the finish line, uh, but, but one of them did, and then was vetoed by the governor. As, uh, as Jennifer said. And we appreciate all of Jennifer's work and her organization's work over the past year, two, year and a half. And, we, and at that forum that we had at, at, about a year ago, Dr. Sandra Stotsky came. And so I want to, uh, we're glad to see her again tonight, and I want to read her bio. Dr. Sandra Stotsky is credited with developing one of the country's strongest sets of academic standards for K-12 students, as well as the strongest academic standards and licensure tests for prospective teachers while serving as Senior Associate Commissioner in the Massachusetts Department of Education from 1999 to 2003. She is also known nationwide for her in-depth analysis of the problems in Common Core's English language art standards. Her current research ranges from the deficiencies in teacher preparation programs and teacher licensure tests to the deficiencies in the k reading curriculum and the question of gender bias in the curriculum. She is regularly invited to testify or, or submit to testimony to state boards of education and state, state legislators on bills addressing licensure tests, licensure standards, and common core standards, for example, in Utah, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, South Carolina, and Texas. She ser currently serves on several committees for the International Dyslexia Association and on the advisory board for Pioneer Institute Center for School Reform. She served on the National Validation Committee for the Common Core State Systemic Initiative, on the National Mathematics Advisory Panel, co-authoring its final report as well as two of its task group reports on the Massachusetts Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and on the Steering Committee 2003 through 2004 for the framework for the National Assessment of Educational Progress Reading Assessments for 2009 onward. Dr. Stotsky was also a member of the Common Core Validation Committee who would not sign off on the Common Core Standards. She is also known nationwide for her in-depth analyses of the problems in Common Core's English Language Arts Standards. Please welcome Dr. Stotsky. days ago that is on the Breitbart newsletter that details what states can do once there is legislation passed that either re requires revision of Common Core or requires a new set of standards altogether to be developed. And there are some steps that can be taken that will 
in many ways ensure that the right people are on these committees and that you then have a real chance of getting much better standards than a warmed over Common Core version as happened in Indiana. Let me begin first with some of the basic facts which are well known but often still contested. As we know, it was not a state-led process. It was developed by three Washington-based private groups, National Governors Association, Council for Chief State School Officers, and Achieve, which is a spin-off of the National Governors Association. They were funded for the purpose of developing Common Core standards by a fourth private organization, Bill and Melinda Gates. And so we now have in 45 states a set of copyrighted standards that were developed by four private organizations. They cannot be revised. They have to be used just as they are, and the project itself has ended, so there is no mechanism for even changing them. So even if Arizona changed the name, that was not a change in the substance of the standards. They are still common core. And even if a test doesn't say that it is a common core test, if it is going to address common core's standards, which is what is in existence in Alaska, which has Alaska academic standards, Pennsylvania, which has Pennsylvania academic standards, or Arizona, which has Arizona academic standards, but they're all basically common core, then it will be a common core test. It may just come out from a different company, but it is still going to be a similar kind of test. test. In my fact sheet, I indicate some of the issues with the people who were chosen to be on the three major groups of people involved in the development of the standards. We know very little about why they were chosen, what their charge actually was, what they were paid, because all the records are private. The organizations that developed Common Core were private, so we have, to this day, no way of knowing why all, almost all of the people on the Standards Development Committee that met first and developed this college readiness level standards, why almost all of them were connected to the testing industry. One can guess, but we have no idea why that was a decision made by whom. We suspect that the Gates Foundation and Achieve had a large role in the selection of that committee and the standards writers themselves, who were singularly unqualified for the tasks that they were charged with. And their credentials are well known. Why the media never bothered to ask why those particular people were chosen, who chose them specifically, what their charge was, how much they were paid. We still to this day do not know. Then we have the validation committee, which I was on. I will say a little bit about it. Professor Milgram will also make some comments about the validation committee. That was another bizarre committee. We were the two experts, Professor Milgram in mathematics, and I was in the English language arts standards. The rest, we don't know why they necessarily were chosen, but this was a committee of under 30 that was charged with looking at the different drafts of the standards as they emerged and ultimately deciding whether they were internationally benchmarked, research-based, and rigorous, among other things. But those were the main charges. And we were two of the five people who would not sign off because we did not agree that they were rigorous standards. And this is, remains the basic problem with these standards, no matter what else you may hear. It's not an implementation problem only. It is not just because they were developed in Washington and it's not local control, as important as those issues are. They are poor quality standards that do not make us competitive and they damage our public school system. And we don't know whether we'll be able to survive. Let me go very quickly to some of the basic flaws in the English language arts standards. 
my one pager is out there also. First of all, I deal with the missing standards. So if you ever have somebody who says, tell me which standard you don't like in Common Core, this is a dodge because a good part of the problem is what's not there. And so you can't pull out a standard you don't like. There are important standards not there. One on the English language, it's history. There is no standard on British literature aside from the mention of Shakespeare. So there's nothing before Shakespeare, nothing after Shakespeare. There's no standard on authors from the ancient world. And there are some other flaws in the document. The deficits are what I have stressed in almost all my testimony. It stresses writing more than reading. It stresses a, an approach to doing everything that involves far more writing in the classroom than teachers should be spending time on. Now, I say this because we know that writing needs practice, but we also know from 100 years of research that good writers were always good readers and that if you do not spend time on reading as your priority, you will not develop good writing. For reasons that only David Coleman, who was one of the chief architects, can explain, there is a stress on writing, not reading, and it is particularly inappropriate in the very earliest grades. The second major flaw, which has received a great deal of attention nationally, has been the reduction of literary texts, the study of literary texts, and the increase in the number of so-called informational texts, about 50-50. And what this does ultimately, two negative problems. First, it reduces the opportunities for the development of analytical reading, thinking, and writing, which comes from English teachers spending time helping students learn how to read between the lines of complex literary texts. And it opened the floodgates for something called informational text that we still to this day do not know exactly what it means, but it means that some very peculiar works are being introduced into English classrooms and taking up the time of what should have been quality literary works. Talk, talk at that time. So we don't have what should have been in the standards, an indication of recommended movements, literary periods, even authors. Not specific works, because that's not the work of standards, but something in the middle between students read a lot and students read X, Y, and Z. We wanted standards that would guide a coherent literature curriculum, it's not there. Finally, the other major problem, which I spent a lot of time trying to correct, were the poorly written standards. They're not fewer, clearer, and deeper, which is a mantra we often hear. Here's an example of what I mean. It's one of Common Core's literature standards for grades 9 and 10, and it asks students to determine a theme or central idea of a text, analyze in detail its development over the course of the text, including how it emerges and is shaped and refined by specific details, semicolon, provide an objective summary of the text. When I presented that as a problematic standard to a group of literary scholars in April at Bloomington, I was told immediately that this was a self-contradictory statement, never mind the other problems with its verbosity. So we have standards, so-called, that need to be unpacked by English teachers. That is a problem we will hear with the math standards as well. They're not well written. Teachers do not know exactly what is expected. They must interpret the standards as they are to use. <coughs> Finally, there is a new problem that I just discovered in working with two historians in the past few weeks on a report that will come out soon from the Pioneer Institute. Most of Common Core's ELA document is about English language arts. It's about 65 pages long. The last eight or nine pages deal with so-called literacy standards for other subjects in the curriculum. 
Here is where the tentacles reach out from the damage that is being done to the English curriculum and actually damage the rest of the curriculum because the standards were written by people who had never taught and who didn't understand a curriculum to begin with. What is the problem with the history, literacy standards? As historians have pointed out, among the major skills that a history teacher at high school level hopes to teach students is a skill for learning contextualization in the approach to a historical document, sourcing, and corroboration. These are not the skills that a literary scholar brings to a literary text. You don't worry about the source of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. You don't worry about corroborating whether or not Jane Austen wrote the work. That is not something you do with a literary text, but it is part of what a history, or histor history teacher or historian does with a historical document. So we have a damaged history curriculum coming from the misapplication of some inappropriate literacy standards. The ones for science may be equally inappropriate, but I haven't looked at those with scientists to find out. So we have a problem up and down the curriculum. I'm going to only briefly mention some of the things now that could be done. And I think I have just a few minutes left, I'm not sure. Eight minutes, okay. <clears throat> if states can at least start to think about how they either stop the funding or curb implementation of common core standards, never mind, at least get them out or get them out, they can think of something that is done in many other countries, having many sets of secondary standards, not just one set. It's not clear at all why we have to have only one set of secondary standards for all students in this country. You can have students who could have an optional accelerated sequence for STEM, an optional accelerated sequence for foreign languages and humanities. Foreign languages have been totally left out of the picture so far. An optional accelerated sequence for performing arts. I have a particular interest in music, and it's being squeezed out of the curriculum. And an accelerated sequence for technical or occupational trades which is one of the most, popu most popular pathways in most other countries for students who do not wish to go on to college, who may not feel that they cannot go on to college or have other reasons for wanting to do other things. And so we have given them no options at the secondary level under Common Core. To have these optional pathways would mean sets of exit exams, which would be appropriate for each pathway, remembering that Common Core is not about getting a high school diploma. People are confused because they think that Common Core is about requirements for a high school diploma. It is not. It is college readiness that is its goal. And college readiness means that if you pass the grade 11 test that's going to come down the pipe soon, you are then qualified for credit bearing coursework in your freshman work year of college, no remedial placement. So that you have a way of doing an end run around high school diploma requirements if the student wishes and if the college accepts the person because they are declared college ready by definition. We need a new testing framework for K-12. There is no reason to accept no child left behind testing framework or common course, which means everybody gets tested from three to eight every single grade. This is over-testing in my judgment. We should have one or two tests, certainly one at the end of high school, an exit test, 
perhaps one at the end of grade eight, but there isn't any reason why we can't use teacher-made tests for all the rest. That's what our teachers are for. Instead of all the teaching to a test that teachers have not had any opportunity to have input in, let's have teacher-made tests, which we always had years ago, and there are ways to make those even better and more even across different sections of the same course. Probably the most important thing, and this goes back to the work I did in Massachusetts, and this is where I will end my remarks, we need to start with the reform of those who become our teachers. Because no matter how much we spend time on developing good standards, they cannot be taught by teachers who are not capable of teaching to them. And so we need to start raising <laughs> Math 
Science Initiative and a member of the Achieve ADP High School Mathematics Standards Panel since 2008, Dr. Milgram has been the main mathematics re reviewer for NCTM curriculum focal points. He has given lectures around the world and has been a member of numerous boards and committees including the National Board of Education Sciences, a body created by the Education Sciences Reform Act of 2002 to advise and consult with the Director of the Institute of Education Sciences on agency policies. Dr. Milgram was also a member of the Common Core Validation Committee who would not sign off on the Common Core Standards. Dr. Milgram has written countless articles on the Common Core Standards detailing how these standards will dumb down our students in math by more than two years and will not prepare our students for a career in science, technology, engineering, and math. He has been traveling around the country with Dr. Sandra Stotsky testifying on the problems with Common Core Math Standards. Please welcome Dr. Milgram. So, uh, so anyway, here, here this thing is, and, and this is, this is just, to, just to start. Uh, one of the big chief selling points of core standards is that they're national standards and they're designed so that a large part of the design is so that the kid coming from, say, the Philippines uh, and the army base in the Philippines to... Oh, oh sir. Okay. <laughs> So, coming from an army base in the Philippines, can enter a school in North Dakota and just be in the same spot as they were when they left. So, uh, but, but then the minute you do this, the minute you do this, as, 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 as Marilyn points out so dramatically, the minute you do this, you absolutely cancel, you cancel any possibility that there's going to be any acceleration that any kids will go beyond what the minimum that core standards demands. So keep that in your mind, because this is, oddly enough, only a minor piece of the issues. summer of 2009, 
And at that point, we had the following charge. The first, of our, uh, the first uh, paragraph of the charge was, Re review the processes used to develop the college and career net readiness standards and recommend improvement in the process. Uh, that's that's uh, a very general sort of thing, uh, but, but the key thing is the next one. Validate the sufficiency of the evidence supporting each college and career readiness standard. Each member is asked to determine whether each standard has sufficient evidence to warrant its inclusion. And if not, add any standard that it, that it was not at that time, was not now included in the Common Core State Standards that they feel should be included and provide the following evidence to support this conclusion. Uh, it was just standard evidence. But, but so what we had at that point was authority first to oversee the development of core standards, and second, if we were dissatisfied with what they produced, rewrite it ourselves. So this committee was a very strong committee set up to make sure that the writing teams for core standards did a decent job. Okay, evidently as part of this, uh, the charge itself was, in, it was it implied that Common Core was to be the standards were to be at the same level as the better international expectations. And uh, it was for college and career readiness. The standards were to match up with what is done internationally. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is that in what, in what follows, I think it will become clear that this was never the intent of the real but hidden leaders of the project. Sandy, uh, alluded to uh, these three mysterious groups. Actually, beyond that, there were a bunch of even more mysterious leaders, and I don't think I'll name them, but I think that it will become evident during the course of this lecture that one can find out for oneself what they might have been. So, let's not get around. Uh, being appointed to the validation committee was a very, very big deal. Uh, it was uh, extremely rigorous, and I, I mean, I don't have a lot of regard for an awful lot that goes on in K-12, but the selection process was as rigorous as any that I've seen in the world of K-12 education, period, over the last 20 years. Uh, it consi the committee consisted of six state governors and five chief state school officers, and they were the ones that made the final decisions on all the members of the committee in theory. And again, I'll, let me reiterate that the, the duties of the Validation Committee were to entirely oversee the development of the Common Core Standards. None of this is true. <laughs> there's a reality and there's a pretend reality, and we are dealing with the pretend reality. In practice, this is how things actually worked. The first draft in the math, and I'll start, I'll just stay with math because I know something about mathematics. I don't know nearly as much about reading, and Sandy has covered that. that. And so the first draft in math stopped with Algebra 1, and that was in September of 2009. Uh, remember, let's recall that the intent and promise of Common Core was to prepare students for both the workforce and for college. Just algebra one doesn't begin to accomplish this. Indeed, to my knowledge, no nonprofit college or university, that is to say public, public or, or private elite like Stanford or Princeton, uh, and public universities like Berkeley or University of Arizona, uh, no nonprofit college or university in the country would admit a student with just algebra one background. So I met with the main writer, because after all, I was a member of the Validation Committee and I had all sorts of authority. I met with the main writers and demanded much more mathematics. They were surprisingly non-committal. I mean, I couldn't get a word out of them saying, yes, you're right, we're going to do this. Uh, soon after that, I got a request 
from to meet with the number of people that achieve, and this is a group that was in theory facilitating the project. Uh, it appeared that what I had to do in order to get that mathematics in there was to convince these people that achieve who knew marginal amount about the subject. Uh, that one needs much more than Algebra 1 to be college and career ready. Uh, and I didn't have to, I didn't have to, and indeed it, I, there was no use even in talking to the people who were called the writers of the document. So this was the first indication I had that things were not as they had seemed. So I met with the chief as I had decided, demanding that they, they do much more. I showed them all kinds of data, including the then new report of the National Math Panel, where, where Sandy played a very important role, and what is done in the high achieving countries. But they didn't initially agree. So we were stuck with Algebra 1. So I kept fighting. Finally, after a lot more work, it turned out that they allowed the writers to include geometry, and the material for a weak Algebra 2 course, but that was it. Now, incidentally, at this point, let me add this, this common parenthetical comment here. Um, the writers didn't understand that, that, that this was it. They thought that after this enormous effort, they had uh, the, implicit, the implicit authority to go as far as they thought was necessary in producing the math curriculum. And at this point, obviously, I had irritated some people because then the powers that be reacted. Almost immediately, the members of the validation committee received a note indicating a major change had just been made in our charge. We no longer had any authority to request changes in the standards. Wow. Now, this is all, it's very, very hard to get this off virtually impossible. So the story I'm telling you now has not been told before, but if there's document documentation that you would like, I happen to have every bit of it. I have every single email that went back and forth between the people facilitating the committee and the committee, for example. So we no longer had any authority to request changes. Instead, what we were asked to do was simply to sign a letter asserting and that's it, the certain, basically, that the standards were excellent. We were given no other choice, we were given no, well, they're, my, they're mediocre, well, they're pretty good, but they're not excellent. We were given no choice. The only choice we were given was to sign this letter saying the standards were excellent. Well, now you get a problem. I'm not for K-12 education. I don't answer to anybody in that area. I, if I answer to anybody, I answer to the head of my department in, in, in mathematics at Stanford. Since the standards were far from being either excellent or even benchmarked to the level of typical international expectations to say nothing at top level, I simply refused to sign the letter. So did Sam. And uh, the powers that be, then made a concerted effort to make it very difficult to find out who were the five out of 29 members of validation that refused to sign off on this at best mediocre document. Now, it's worth noting something here. I was afraid that McCullen would come uh, to this meeting, but I, I didn't see him. Um, but I'm going to actually compliment him. He won't take it as a compliment, but I am. Um, so it was my belief, based on uh, one, one actual remarks, verbatim remarks of the main writers when they, that they made in 2010, that they actually felt exactly as I did, that the standards were woefully good. And they were really annoyed when they discovered, this is my belief, they never said this part publicly. But my belief is that they were extremely ignored when they found out that they could not go beyond that weak algebra to limit. And uh, so let, here's a direct quote from Bill McCallum in January of 2010. 
It's not what we aspire to for our children. It's not what we as a nation want to set as the final deliverable. I completely agree with that. And we should go beyond that. So this was the real perspective of the one of probably the lead writer of the standards. And the document that he was talking about in January of 2010 is basically, with very small changes, the document that is the final version. Uh, the second lead writer was Jason Zimba. And here's a direct quote from Jason Zimba in March 23, 2010. The standards are, and I quote, for the colleges most kids go to, but not for the colleges most parents aspire. What he meant here, nice way of saying, subtle way of saying, they're meant for community colleges or for profit universities. So if you're interested in going to the University of Phoenix as a local community college, hey, these are just for you. So, um, and then he continued. In, in, and was now explicit, they are not for STEM and not for selective colleges or universities. So these are the statements by the, by the actual writers, the lead writers of the standards, their perspective on what they were having to deal with. And uh, this is what, I mean, what, what the document they were talking about at this point, both of them, was a document that was essentially identical, except that the final document was a little weaker than what they were talking about. So again, Zimba pointed out why this is so when he said, the minute, he said, and he repeated this several times, the minimal college-ready student is a student who passed Algebra 2. But hey, in my, with my efforts, we got from Algebra 1 to Algebra 2. So, uh, if I hadn't been so determined, uh, I think they would have never changed the algebra one. They would have never added to it. And we wouldn't have even been able to say this. Now, I can't, I can't say that algebra two is, uh, I can't say that it's a very good level for a college entry. Uh, maybe we could do a little bit uh, of data. I've avoided doing that. I, I find that people really turn off when they see data. But maybe you'll be interested in this data. So here is the determination of the odds of obtaining a four-year college degree and if, uh, against the highest mathematics course completed in high school. And the data is for, for 1982 class, 1992 class. And, it, and what I understood is that for the 2002 class, uh, it appears to be similar. And for the 20, uh, 2012 class, uh, although the data is very raw right now, it appears to be even weaker. So, I can't believe this. <laughs> so, okay. So here's the, uh, the students that, that took Algebra 2, their odds, their odds, so if they stopped with Algebra 2, their odds in, 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 in 1992, uh, sorry, in, in 1982, were 46% that they would get a college degree. But already by 1992, it had dropped to 39%. And today, the best estimate is if you complete Algebra 2, you have about a 31 to 33% chance of ever getting a college degree. But if you go, look what happens if you go even one level beyond that. If you go, if you go up to trigonometry, they suddenly jumped to 64%, 65%, uh, and 60% in, in 92. And by the time, if you, also, if you take calculus, it's almost a guarantee, 82 and 83%. So, you, I'll leave it to you to decide if Algebra 2 is a proper out of college readiness level. So, just to emphasize, here we are, let's look again at the that as we go up the slide. So, and it's also worthwhile seeing what happens, um, what happens across the country, which high schools 
make, make math courses beyond, say, Algebra two most accessible to students. So this gives a pretty good picture of the inherent inequity of Simba's definition of college readiness. And so here we are. If it, this is by socioeconomic district, socioeconomic level is what determines this. The highest quintile, 71.6% uh, of, the, student, of the, the high schools in the country, uh, which are in the richest neighborhoods, have at least calculus as a course. By the time you get down to the lowest quintile, the lowest fifth, is 43%. Just a little more than half. So, this is what you're dealing with here. Um, you can, you, you, you are not only uh, giving an absolute minimal definition of college readiness, you are virtually guaranteeing that the people most harmed by this definition are the students coming from the poorest districts. The kids you would most want to help. Okay. As everybody knows, you pays your money and you takes your choice. Now, uh, our, next, our next presenter is Zev Berman, is a visiting scholar with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Between 2007 and 2009, he served as a senior advisor in the U.S. Department of Education under George W. Bush, and is currently an executive with Monolithic 3D Inc., a Silicon Valley semiconductor startup company. In 2010, he served on the California Academic Content Standards Commission, that evaluated the suitability of the Common Core Standards for California. He's the co-author with Dr. Stotsky of the white paper, Common Core Standards Still Don't Make the Grade, published by Pioneer Institute in 2010, along with many other publications about the Common Core Standards and how they will not prepare our students for college nor a career. Please welcome Sir Berman. Jennifer? Yes. She's trying to. Okay, here we go. Here's our first question. Is there a better set of English and math standards, and what do you recommend? Yes, there are, as 
Okay, so and I'll tell you, uh, Dr. Dr. Stosky said at the forum last uh, fall at the legislature, and I'll hold her to it if we ever get this chance, that she would be willing to come in gratis to help rewrite Arizona's standards. This question is, uh, no more calculus in high school, question mark? When was it stopped? No trig, question mark. Milgram, you want to? Yeah, I, can, I guess I better answer that. I think, I think if we're going to get this working, Zeb has it. Uh, okay. I, yeah. So let's see. Uh, when was when was it stopped? Well, uh, the answer is not when was it stopped. When will it stop? And the answer there is this: uh, in a, in a state like California. Uh, we force the poorest districts to, to, to have calculus courses because they were part of the standards. Uh, they weren't, students weren't obliged to take calculus, but we insisted in California that students would have the, have the uh, uh, if they wanted to take calculus, they would be able to. And every district in the state was obliged higher calculus teachers. Uh, calculus teachers are expensive and they're of limited use from the perspective of, of many high schools. And so what happens when they're not required, when you have standards that say, gee, we don't want to go beyond algebra two and nothing is forcing us to, uh, what happens is really very simple. And this is more so in the, in the, in the weakest districts, the districts with the least funding. 
Uh, but what happens is, boy, the minute that teacher indicates, well, you know, I think I'm getting tired of this, I want a higher wage, uh, by, by God, the answer to that is, bye. And so they disappear. They disappear, individual by individual. And calculus becomes inaccessible. So, so, they, they, so they, they, once you've got standards that say, we're not, we're not obliging anybody to do anything beyond the weak algebra two course, then the reality is you're not going to see more than a weak algebra two course. And this is especially true in the poorest districts. Thank you, Doug. Um, Jennifer, you have another question or two? We've got a we've got a whole basket of questions here. What does the National Council of Teachers of English have to say about Common Core? Uh, the NCTE has played a very ambivalent role. It was expecting to be at the table when Common Core was being developed and soon realized that the reduction in literary study was not something their own teachers were going to be happy with. It has ended up, when I last looked, which is about last year, with a position that they neither support nor oppose Common Core. In other words, they're trying to sit on the fence. They are going to support English teachers in the age of Common Core. So that is how they have decided politically <laughs> to handle this hot potato because they have had resolutions against Common Core and there are many radical uh, members of NCTE who don't like testing to begin with and don't like standards at all. And I remember them 20 years ago. So they're still very unhappy campers and this organization doesn't know what it can do about it. Great, thank you, Dr. Stowski. It looks like we're ready to roll here. Yep. Go. Uh, thank you. We moved from windows to Linux and uh, some magic and some sweat and the course. Oh, thank you. Uh, I will... Oops. Uh, I will start with a, a clarion call for the common core standards. I hope my accent did not disturb you too much. Oh, clearly it's not from California, even though I came from California. <laughs> I grew up in Israel. The benchmarking for success was a document published in the fall of 2008, just as Obama was coming in, into his term. And it basically made a call for common core standards for all states. And this is what it said. I'm kind of magnifying the piece that is interesting. And it says, action item one is upgrade state standards by adopting the common core of internationally benchmark standards in math and language arts for grade A12 to ensure that students are equipped with the necessary knowledge and skills to be globally competitive. Sounds wonderful. And what is the definition of rigor? As you see, this is down the same page. But by eighth grade, students in top performing nations are studying algebra and geometry, while in the US, most eighth grade math courses focus on arithmetic. In fact, the curriculum studied by the typical American eighth grader is two years behind the curriculum being studied by eighth grader in high performing countries. Exactly true. So, this is a call why we need supposedly higher children standards. Well, uh, this is what we ended up with. We ended up with 8th grade that is not algebra, despite the call for algebra in 8th grade. We have pre-algebra in 8th grade. People will tell you, oh, but it has some algebra. Sure, the 3rd grade standard also has some algebra. This is pre-algebra course. Common core, Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, are reserved for high school. That delays uh, the growth of students. And, in fact,
fact that algebra that we get there even is not really the traditional algebra, but we get kind of a variant, I call it here functional algebra. And there is a missing content in algebra too. Jim Milgram mentioned it before as a weak algebra too, missing content. And even the highest content, all of the content of high school math beyond algebra too, because there is some left over that's supposed to be just for extra or accelerated students. It's all short of pre -calculus. That's the highest aspiration of common core, falling short of pre -calculus. And here is Jason Zimmer, one of the principal authors, last year saying, if you want to take calculus your freshman year in college, you will need to take more mathematics than is in the common core. Very simple. They like it. Now, a lot of people here, algebra in grade 8, this is, why? Why do we care? Yes, so other people may be doing this in Singapore, say, or Japan. How important it is. Who cares? We have four years for high school. That's plenty of time for doing algebra and algebra 2 and calculus, if you really insist. What the big deal? Why do you push us? Well, a we had an experiment in OPEC. Supposed to go forward. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, let me go here and jump a few things. Uh, California was an interesting experiment. And I come from California, so it's easy for me to talk about the data. California, in 1997, has new set of rigorous standards, widely acknowledged as the best standard in the country. And they expected students in eighth grade to take algebra. They didn't force it. The student had to be ready. Not ready, student did take algebra. But over time, we hope students will be ready. This is the distribution of schools taking algebra in grade eight. And what you see here is that uh, as you go farther uh, right here on the bottom, this is a higher percentage of students taking algebra and grade eight. And the higher you go on the vertical scale, the better achievement is of this cohort. And it's what you would expect. The more people take algebra, the lower score. Kind of unsurprising. That's how we started. This was 2004. A year later, a ten years later, kids taking algebra by grade A, and many, many, many of them are successful. Not all. A lot of people do it well, a lot of other people didn't learn how to do it well, but it's doable. Many, many schools have advanced average score, which is wonderful, and take very high fraction of students into algebra. Okay, sounds good. And this is how the two pictures work together, doesn't matter. Okay. This is the same number in bar chart, and you see the fraction of the cohort going up, taking algebra 2 by grade 8, and the upper color, the orange piece, is the successful student taking proficient and above. So those are successful takers, not only the middle, which is basic, and the bottom orange, the pink is kind of below basic. And you see the numbers are growing, and the same thing on the bottom are the absolute number of students, more than 100,000 students more take successfully algebra by grade 8. Okay, big deal. What we really care is how they do in high school. Indeed. Okay, this is the same picture in high school. Algebra 2 by grade 11. You see the numbers grow and the success rate grows. So indeed, at least up to algebra level, algebra 2 level, 
the early taking of algebra translated into growth in algebra 2. Let's see how different demographic groups change over the same 10 years. And you see the blue is the early 2003, the reddish is the 2012. Notice all of them increased, but the minority achievement increased much faster. Look at the white. The white increased almost double, but you look at the low SES student, it was six times higher in algebra 1, algebra 2, geometry. Look how about BC and AD calculus. The numbers again increase, and again, the numbers of minorities grow much faster. So this is a perfect exactly what early achievement when algebra offers you. It offers you higher achievement in high school. Exactly what one would expect. Well, let's not go there. Maybe this is something important. Uh, not this, not this. The key to this success really was that the case to set and standards prepared everyone for taking algebra in the day. Not everybody learned enough to be ready to take algebra, indeed, but the numbers were very big. Over two thirds of California cohort eventually are still took algebra by grade. Now the numbers are going to drop like a stone. Until last year, two thirds, and it kept growing as you saw. Today, it's common code. The K7 common code does not prepare every student to take algebra. They say, oh, but you can accelerate. Sure you can. Who will accelerate? Not the disadvantaged student, the student that will get support outside the curriculum outside the schoolhouse, by tutors, by siblings, by father, by mother, not the disadvantaged students. That's what common for does. They say, oh, but this is the flaw. Indeed, and overwhelmingly, the students from disadvantaged background are taught to the floor. Okay. Jim already quoted Jason Zimba that those standards are good for some colleges, for the college, colleges most kids go to, but not for the colleges most parents aspire to. And Bill McCallum, again saying a similar thing, the standards are not at the level we aspire for our children. They admit it. It's not me arguing this. Now, I was on the California uh, committee that evaluated the Common Core Standard. We had to add, and we agreed to add, a full course in calculus, in advanced statistics, and we made major supplementation to missing content in algebra 2 and trigonometry. We also, I, not we here, but I and my colleague of mine, we try also to get some changes that will prepare more students for this in elementary grades. This was rejected because they were grade by grade tests and everybody was afraid of pushing too much because hey, we, test, we are testing on this, so why should we push more? Right. Very disappointed. But at least in high school, we offer much bigger press and depth that the, some, someone like California, some state like California take, just vanilla, common core. Uh, now, I wanted to touch on a few things. How am I on its time? Okay. Uh, the point is not only with algebra, in early algebra or algebra in grade. This is just a nice big sign. Look, it's a weak system. But the problems, the weaknesses of common core go across the grades. Interestingly, in the early grades is actually very demanding. Too demanding. In later grade, it's slow down. Very much so. That by grade 8, we are about two years indeed behind our international achievers, uh, uh, high achievers. Uh, let's see some. Let me show you something here, and you cannot see much. But I kind of try to trace that it's simply addition and subtraction. 
Because when you talk to common core proponents, they will say, you know, we expect fluency with standard algorithm in common core, most state standard in expectance. And they are right. They did it a bit late, they did it in grade 4, the last line on the bottom. Meanwhile, they filled the third grade before them with a variety of pedagogy that is not necessarily helpful for developing proficiency and fluency with standard algorithm. So yes, they dropped the last standard at the bottom, much later than other higher achieving nations. But they fill in the time in between with a lot of confusing pedagogy, and then somehow magically they would expect they will they expect that it will happen in grade four. We'll see at how it will. Let me give you some examples. Here is a kindergarten standard that is actually too demanding. The blue parts, the recording composition and the composition by equations in an abstract form is completely inappropriate for kindergarten. Some kids may do it, most kids cannot, and there is no reason to expect them. They are at that concrete level. They cannot co connect, you know, three apples and seven apples is three plus seven equal ten. There are no apples in the three plus seven equal ten. What is this strange equal sign? It's not for them. And here is grade one stuff. Grade one sounds good. Add and subtract within 20, demonstrate influence with addition subtractions within 20. You know what? Not bad. Pretty good. <laughs> Except that the standard didn't end up. Use strategies such as counting on, making 10, decomposing number, reading of 10, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Using the relationship, blah, blah, blah. And creating DC1. So they say, oh, fewer people. This is six standards. Except that this standard, Jim says, it's 80% of content in first grade. Really. That's what you want to spend time on. 80% on this one, so-called one standard. But there are 20 other standards. This is the fewer and different. It's ridiculous. Okay, now I have a couple of minutes. I wanted to talk about international benchmarking. There have been multiple studies done, maybe half a dozen by now, how truly rigorous Common Core is as compared to other high achieving nations. All of them found Common Core below, with one exception. Bill Schmidt, in the Schmidt hearing, did a study a couple of years back. In published couple of years. And he did find that they are on par with international knowledge. The only study, which happened to be one of the people in the validation committee also of the Common Core, who signed off that they are excellent. But he's highly qualified, don't laugh. He is a serious person, I'm not joking. He did the original 1995 team's self international mass and science study actually found U.S. falling behind, and he was the U.S. coordinator. So, he published a lot of work there, and he basically took the Common Core and mapped them, very similarly what he did in 1995, when he mapped the high achieving teams countries, and he wanted to show they are the same. So this is our experience. It's here on explaining about the teams. It's basically, 40 countries participated in that time. Uh, Schmidt and his colleagues took the six top achieving nations, analyzed the curriculum, and they called them the A plus countries. Those are the A plus country curricula, and the presumption is that people that want to be like them should similarly adjust the curriculum to be like those. Okay. This is how the original teams ranking or grading or table, if you wish, it was coded. You basically have a list of topics at every row, and you have the grades one through eight, 
as a column. And the every place where you have a top is basically where most of the six countries, eight plus countries, had this particular topic. So, it, as you see, it very, seems very logical, and it probably is to so highly analyzed as it was praised and such. So it starts with early grades with just three main topics, then in second grade there are also three, then in seventh grade maybe are six, seven, and you kind of see that at a certain point they drop the early topics, and it's very rational, hey, the look. And it, Important to look at this because the order of the topics, the not order of roles, is the coherence. The more difficult and hierarchical and depend on the earlier one, the less difficult, so the more difficult go down, the easier up. Uh, each column has not too many dots that show the focus of the curriculum, you don't have too many topics every year. And if you have not too many topics, you can afford to go deep. So this is an exemplary kind of curriculum. Good. So he took the common core, and here is his chart, his own chart, also his chart of common core. And it, you know what? It looks about the same. It makes sense. Look, it's coherent. Look, it's focused. Look, it's kind of the same shape, and it talks in this paper and its presentation of the shape. Look at the shape, it's very similar. That's why it is indeed supposedly on par with high achieving nations, right? Makes sense. There is minor problem. Let me put this. This is the same two tables that you saw before. The left one is the teams, the right one is the common core. But now I color the row in the original order and I kept the same colors on the other side. Notice that he hashed the order. Suddenly, topics like, if I go to this side, here, you have three geometry showing up before the geometry basic. Where is the coherence of that? You have Relations of fractions, of common fractions to decimal, before decimal fractions are even taught. He completely messed up the coherence. And, you know, with any curriculum, truly, as long as you don't care about the order of the row, you can achieve a triangular shape. <laughs> Just makes no sense. But that's what he did. And then, he proudly concluded, There being no major difference between the two sets of standards, evidence that CCSM are coherent and very consistent with the international benchmark. So this is the proof of international benchmarking of common law. All the other five studies said not even close. I think I'm done here, no? and I hope you enjoyed my weird accent. And thank you for your And that's important for you to know because that gets at uh, really who adopts these standards and will, I'm going to say it this way, will enforce these standards. Diane Douglas Formal Education consists of an associate degree in business from Somerset County College and a Bachelor's of Science in Business Marketing from Rutgers University. She served as a board member of the Peoria Unified School District from 2005 to 2012 and as president of the Peoria School Board from 2008 to 2009. She has studied the history of the American education system and the federal government's ever-increasing intrusion into our local control since the early 1990s. She understands states' rights and why it is so important to have local control over education. Diane Douglas. Thank you, Jane. Everybody hear me? Um, I think I'll just share a little bit. So much that I talk about Common Core has already been um, 
explain to you, but let me get begin with a little bit about myself. Again, my name is Diane Douglas. I'm running for superintendent of public instruction. My family, which is my husband and our daughter, moved here from what I fondly refer to as the People's Republic of New Jersey back in 1990. Any other refugees in the room? Don't see anybody tonight. We moved here not because we happened to be transferred here or because we were forced to come here. We came here, we visited Arizona, we looked around and we said, this is where we want to raise and educate our daughter. And I'm so disappointed when I hear our education system disparaged the way that it is. Our daughter got a great education here. They spend a lot of money on education in New Jersey. I would not have had her in those schools. And we're very thankful and very blessed by what has occurred while we've been here in Arizona. And um, we're expecting our first grandchild, so we're very excited about that, too. Thank you. So, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, how am I going to get that child through the education system? But what I discovered, I went to a PTA meeting one night when she was in second grade. And I had, before that, I did what all moms did. I volunteered for bake sales, got on the PTA, helped at the carnival, helped at the book sale, all that stuff. But one night I went to school and our principal stood up and told us how proud he was to tell us that in the, we had K-8 school in fifth through eighth grade, some astronomically high number of the students had earned what was called a certificate of merit or higher. I had a second grader, I didn't know what that meant, so I turned and I asked and they told me it wasn't that those children had B averages or higher, they had all Bs or higher on their report card, and I can remember sitting there, I can still picture the room when I closed my eyes thinking, holy cow, they're cooking the books. Because you can't have 65, 75, 85% of the students in the top 20 percentile of performance unless something is happening that's out of the ordinary. So it sparked a passion in me to understand our American education system, not just, um, curriculum and things, but what did our founding fathers intend? How did we get the system that it has evolved into being? Quite frankly, how did we go from being the best in the world at educating our children to mediocre at best? One of the things I wanted for my daughter from our education system was that she would become a knowledgeable adult, have a lot of academic content knowledge and rigor, that they would help rather than hinder me um, instilling morals and values in my daughter and not fight against our family values, and that they would prepare her to be a well-educated, self-governing American citizen who understands the liberty and the blessings of this country and would help perpetuate them when she became an adult. And I think that's what most Americans still want from their education system. I believe that's what most Americans think we're getting from our education system. Unfortunately, now we have a system that all too often refers to our children as human capital and thinks that just enough education to hold a job is sufficient. And I don't believe that's what any of us ever intended. You know, I started looking into um, the history this is not a um, partisan issue. Both sides are equally culpable. If you look back over the history of the last, since the 1960s, starting with Lyndon Johnson and his great society, every president has tried to grab a bigger and bigger, bigger role in our education. Just kind of in a nutshell, and I want to share with you some of the things that are going on here in Arizona, too. Um, but the difference, people ask me, what's the difference between No Child Left Behind and Common Core, what we're doing now? Well, first of all, um, all of them are unconstitutional. The federal government has no role to play within the education system. But the difference with No Child Left Behind is that the federal government set up goals that we had to reach. But we reached them using our own standards that were written and created here in Arizona that could be applied as we wanted them here in Arizona and could be changed if we needed to upgrade them here in Arizona. What has happened now with um, the Common Core standards, 
is we're being told not only this is what you will do, this is how you will do it. And it will be the same regardless of um, what state you're in. Um, I wanted to talk to just for a few minutes about our State Board of Education because that is instrumental in helping fix this problem. I see um, three ways that we can go about fixing the problem with Common Core. We can do it through the governor's office and we absolutely, it is imperative that we elect a governor who's willing to put control of the Arizona education system back into the hands of Arizona. That happens. We can do it legislatively. In the 2013 legislative session, there was basically one bill, if you set aside any budgeting process, that dealt with Common Core, House Bill um, 2425, and basically that empowered the State Board of Ed more than to do more with Common Core and testing. But last year, this past session that just closed, we had, I believe it was six bills opposing Common Core and one of them made it to the governor's desk. Unfortunately, she vetoed it. But that is a monumental swing in just one year's time. So that's another way. The other way to fix it is through our State Board of Ed. That is um, constitutionally mandated. We have 11 members. And one of the issues with, there's a couple of issues with our State Board of Ed. First of all, it is not constitutionally um, comprised, if you will. We're entitled as citizens of Arizona to have four lay members on that State Board of Education. Right now we have all education insiders who are putting their, their goals and their dreams for education, if you will, ahead of you and your children. You know, people ask me, they say, uh, or comment to me that I'm a quote unquote one issue candidate because my big issue is Common Core. Make no mistake. Common Core is the title, Common Core is what's coming from the federal government, but the one issue in this election is to whom does the education of our children belong? I am tired of education, uh, the, the ivory tower of education, colleges of education, telling us what they want to do with our children. They should be, we should be telling them what we expect for our children. They shouldn't be telling us what we must accept and how they want to experiment with our children. So we have to be careful. And what we have seen happen with our State Board of Ed and with it being um, inappropriately uh, membered, if you will, is that they are putting so many unelected boards ahead of you and your locally elected school board. We have the Arizona Ready Council, used to be called the P20 Council, which literally came right out of the DNC playbook, and every state had one, and its goal was to not set policy, because they don't have the authority to set policy, but they guide and control policy from behind the scenes. P stands for preschool, 20 stands for grade 20. That's the influence they want them to have. And talk about conflict of interest. We have the uh, Expector Arizona, we have First Things First, we have the Chamber of Commerce telling us how we must educate our children. And they have phenomenal amounts of money from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in order to do public relations, to convince us these unvetted, unproven things are better for our children. In the um, professional side, we have the Arizona School Board Association, one of the things I want to do when I'm your superintendent is I want to set up alternate training for our school board members. Because what we do right now is you elect people at the local level on your school board to go represent you. They go to the Arizona School Board Association to get training. And I can tell you from personal experience, what the Arizona School Board Association tells them is your job is to hire the superintendent and then get out of the way and let them do what they want to do. If they want you to vote yes, you vote yes. If they want you to vote no, you vote no, but you implement their policy. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the tail wagging the dog. You, you elect your local members, they're your neighbors, they are supposed to be listening to you. They are supposed to be hearing what you want for your children and your grandchildren, and then they are supposed to be directing the superintendent that that's the direction that our children are going. Okay. 
Um, just let me touch on one or two more things really quickly. Another thing you must understand, there's so much more than just Common Core with the Race to the Top application. The federal government is telling us Common Core is how we must educate our children and the testing that comes along with it. They also tell us how we are to evaluate and compensate our teachers. They tell us how we are to evaluate our schools, the ABCDF letter system that we changed to. But the last part I'll touch on just very briefly is probably the most insidious, which is the data collection they are mandating on our children. We were mandated to create what's called a statewide longitudinal data system. And just to conclude, I want to uh, read to you from the Department of Labor what their intentions are is to work um, with the state's statewide longitudinal data system to follow individuals through uh, school and into and through the workforce, beginning pre-K, through post-secondary, through entry, and sustained participation in the workforce. This is from the Federal Department of Labor's uh, website, their mission statement for their, um, they call it their Workforce Data Quality Initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what they do in Communist China. Communist China is where our current superintendent of schools, Mr. Hupenthal, was sent to evaluate their system and bring back ideas for our education system. I don't make promises, but I will promise you this. As your superintendent, I am never going to go to a communist country to see how they educate their children. that have been stowed upon this country across the world than any other nation in the history of mankind and that's what I want for our students here in Arizona to return with that. So with that I see I kind of got the hook and I will be delighted to answer any questions when the time comes. And now uh, Frank Riggs is a candidate for governor of Arizona. For the past 16 years, Frank's, Frank Riggs has been a leader in Arizona and nationally in the effort to expand parental school choice and reform and improve K-12 education, both as a U.S. congressman and as the CEO of the largest nonprofit dedicated to helping public charter schools finance and build facilities. The Conservative Heritage Foundation said, quote, Representative Riggs spearheaded many cutting edge initiatives like school choice and charter schools, close quote. Riggs has promised to repeal Arizona's participation in Common Core to protect local control of standards and assessments, parental rights, and charter school autonomy, and to reassert Arizona's state sovereignty and responsibility for K-12 education. Mr. Frank Riggs. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege to be with you back clean up after this very distinguished academic panel. I don't know about you, but whenever the conversation gets into high math, my palms begin to sweat. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm sorry, to this day. Um, but thank you. It, it was very, very educational. And nice job, Diane. Uh, she just gets better every time I hear her. She's going to be extraordinary superintendent of public instruction. <laughs> out, with that, out with that guy, I don't even want to say his name, but out with that guy who referred to us all as barbarians. You bet we are when it comes to, to the education of our kids and in some people's cases, their grandkids. <laughs> and thank you, Andy, great job. You can see why he was elected by his colleagues as the president, the leader of the state senate, because he has a unique ability to facilitate communication and move towards consensus. And there is a consensus emerging in our state, which is we want nothing to do with Common Core. So I'm going to be brief. Uh, I, am, I just want to tell you a little bit about my biographical background. I also should do a couple of shout outs, I think, here real quick here. Brad McQueen, the author of The Cult of Common Core. <laughs> Man, it truly has the courage of his convictions, continuing to teach in one of our fine public schools. I see Anita Christie, who does a beautiful, fact-based, well-researched blog called both Gilbert and Gila, as in Gila County Watch, and has written prolifically on the subject. My friends from Northwest Conservatives down in Tucson, whose endorsement and support I'm honored to have, and I'm very honored to have the endorsement and support of Arizonans Against Common Core. 
I, I just want you to know I'm a, uh, I'm a proud Army veteran. I'm the only veteran running for governor. I'm a former police officer and deputy sheriff who married a police officer. My wife at the back, my wife, Kathy, of 34 years, native daughter, born in Tucson. For a nice little bit of symmetry last week, Kathy and I welcomed our third grandchild into the world. Savannah Elizabeth Riggs, who, like her paternal grandmother, will now be a native daughter of Arizona. So. And really, when we, got, when we got the news that our son Matt and his beautiful wife Erin, our daughter-in-law, obviously, were expecting over the holidays last year, that was, I think, the final motivation I needed to become a candidate for the highest office in our state. After spending these last 16 years, Andy talked about it, joking all the while that I was a recovering politician. But I just think the stakes for our state and our country are so great that we have to have a proven, tested, and trusted leader at the helm. And someone, by the way, who's not running for governor because it's a vanity candidacy. This isn't about my ambition, my ego. It isn't about the next elective office or re-entering politics for the long term. It's about doing the right thing, demonstrating the courage to make the tough but very necessary decisions, one of which will be using the executive authority of the governor's office to repeal our participation in common <laughs> on the day of the day. Now, said she, she doesn't make promises. I, I do make some promises. I've made several promises in my life. I've taken oaths. And an oath is a promise. It's a vow. I took an oath when I voluntarily enlisted in the United States Army. I took an oath when I became a police officer, pinned on the badge, the law enforcement oath of honor to protect and serve the public put literally my life on the line, if necessary. I took an oath when I was sworn into Congress. And I actually took a fourth vow when I married Kathy 34 years ago. But when I give my word, when I make a promise, you can take it to the bank. And I'm going to push back hard against the federal government. And I'm gonna stop the federalization, what I call the abominization of Arizona. And you have my word on that, my oath. And while, and while you know, I wanna make our state less, not more dependent on the federal government. I want to stand firmly for the 10th Amendment, for state sovereignty. I want to reclaim our legitimate responsibility, as Senator Burgess well knows, for K-12 education. Well, I, while I think it is important to have a governor who stand firmly on that, I also think it'd be a very good thing for Arizona's next governor to have successful experience serving in the United States Congress as a proven reformer and leader in that body. In my third and final term as a United States Congressman, Newt Gingrich, Speaker Gingrich, came to me and said, I'd like you to chair the House Education Subcommittee. And my initial reaction was, why me? What have I done wrong? <laughs> but he and his staff explained to me that they, they knew my background. I'd been a school board member and two-term school board president, just like Diane in my home community. And they wanted me to take the, the chairmanship of that committee because we were intent at that point in at least downsizing, if not dismantling altogether, the unconstitutional U.S. Department of Education. We couldn't get rid of it altogether, although we promised to in the contract with America, because Bill Clinton was in the White House. So we did the next best thing. We took all of those federal education programs and systematically turned them into block grants. And we were headed in the right direction. Oh, by the way, we also balanced the federal budget. The, the only time, in really, in, in modern history, where we actually reduced federal government spending and the size and the scope and the reach and the power of the federal government. When I left Congress in 1998 to keep my term limits commitment, the federal budget was balanced. It generated surpluses for four consecutive years thereafter. And we had fundamentally reformed welfare by imposing time limits and work requirements on able-bodied welfare recipients. But we did convert those programs into block grants. I know those programs backwards and forwards. And what's happened since I left Congress in 1998, of course, federal programs have gotten more and more prescriptive. They provide a relatively small amount of the overall funding for K-12 education. Yet they dictate, and certainly in the case of Common Core, the standards and tests that we would use to educate our kids. And how insidious is it? Well, I always carry this quote with me. There, We've had a lot of forums and debates. The, gubernatorial candidates for the Republican nomination. You know, one of them is a big supporter of Common Core, what he prefers to call Arizona's college and career ready standards. Uh, I have some other opponents who, who give the impression that they're opposed to Common Core, but won't take a firm stance and won't explain to you, because you're entitled to know the voter before you make your decision. They won't explain exactly what steps they'll take to get rid of it. A week ago tonight, 
I asked at Forum in Scottsdale, I asked Mr. Ducey, state treasurer, never held legislative office, never had to cast a single tough vote. My first, first votes as a member of Congress, by the way, were on the first Persian Gulf War resolution. And my last votes as a member of Congress were on the Articles of Impeachment against Bill Clinton. Yeah. And that's, those are tough votes. <laughs> the first case that involves war and peace and life and death, and you're putting young men and women in our military in harm's way. And in the latter case, you're voting to impeach a sitting United States president. So I have a deep, proven record. In fact, 3,000 plus votes. But my point is, I asked at that forum a week ago tonight, I asked it, you say that you oppose Common Core, tell us tonight, since you've dodged the question repeatedly at every single forum and debate, tell us exactly what steps you'll take to get rid of Common Core. And he didn't. He wouldn't. So, it, 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 you know, folks, I just want to be very clear because I hope this comes up in our Q&A that if I said I'm going to use the executive authority of the governor's office to get rid of Common Core because it, Common Core represents the further federalization of K-12 education, the nationalization of standards and tests that we're going to use to educate our kids. And there are people that maintain, well, you can have national standards and tests and you can still have curriculum decisions made at the local level. Baloney. Bill Gates says when the tests are aligned to the Common Core standard, the curriculum will line up as well. Bill Gates, the big funder, right? So there's no possible way that that's the case. We have to rip it out by the roots. So I'm going to do that. But you know what? I'm not going to wait until I take the Oval Office and assume that office. The day after the general election, I'm going to make it very clear to the appointees, the gubernatorial appointees on the State Board of Education, that I expect their resignation. Any incoming governor has the right to demand the resignation of the appointees of the prior governor, and in this case, her administration, so that you can form your own team. You can have your own people on there. And Diane's already explained that the current makeup or composition of the state board does not comply with our state constitutional mandate as to the competition, composition rather, of the state board. And then I'm going to work with Senate President Biggs because I understand, having served in the highest legislative body in our country, that the legislative branch and executive branch of government are co-equal partners. In fact, the legislative branch is one of its chief responsibilities is to impose restraints on the executive branch under our elaborate federal and state system of checks and balances. But I'm going to work with Andy as a partner and a colleague and, and with Judy and the other members of the state legislature. We're going to defund Common Core. We're going to save the taxpayer, and I think there's varying estimates as to the actual cost, but we're going to save the taxpayers the hundreds of millions of dollars it will take for, to continue with the full implementation of, of Common Core. And we're going to restore local control and decision making. <laughs> and we're going to protect, we're going to protect parental rights and parental school choice. We're going to protect charter school autonomy, and we're going to protect homeschooling. And again, again, you have my word, my solemn oath on that. I'm prepared to do this job. I have the background. I can walk my talk when I say that I'll be the education governor. I understand the governor has to be able to do more than one thing at a time. So public safety, of course, is the first and most important responsibility of state government. But K-12 education is a very close second because we're talking about, obviously, our, the future of our kids and our grandkids and our destiny as a state and as a country. So it's good to be with you tonight. I look forward to your questions and answers. I'd be happy to get into a little bit more detail about the documents, the agreements that got us into Common Core and how we can get out of those documents, those agreements, and out of Common Core, but you have my commitment to do just that. I think we should give another round of applause to our educational panel. Very appreciative of the, of the message you, and, uh, and information you gave us tonight. I feel much more education, much more educated tonight. Now, I have questions, and the first round of questions here are all, believe it or not, directed at you three. Yeah. And, here, and here's the first question: I consider you the three. Uh, excuse me. I consider the three of you the foremost experts on Common Core, and we're surprised you were not part of the. We will not conform event last week. Number one, were you invited to participate? And two, what did you think of the event? Or do you know anything about the event?
I guess it works. Uh, I was considering going there, and then eventually my, I think my accent didn't work out well. <laughs> uh, in any case, I watched it uh, on the movie screen. It's uh, not too many. This is Northern California, very liberal. Uh, I think it's very important. It's very important in the sense that the message is going far and wide. Yes. Until now, the message, as emotional as it was and as detailed as it was, it was limited in reach. So I have high hopes that it will reach much wider audience, even though the actual details there may have been not so many, but for large audiences, you cannot have too many details. Thank you. Dr. Hilda, this one is for you. In the documentary, Building the Machine, you explain that states that accepted Common Core also agreed to require their universities to accept students who passed a Common Core exit exam and only give math courses for credit. How will this affect our three state universities and our community colleges? That's an interesting question because this is an interesting and unusual state. Is it on? Yeah. Very good. Um, how, how will it affect them? Well, less than in most every other state. Speak in with the microphone directly. I can't get closer. Okay. Is it, this might be better. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, in, in Arizona, in Arizona, the, your, your colleges and universities, your, your in particular, Arizona State and the University of Arizona um, are the only ones that Seb and I found uh, four years ago when we looked at this that only required uh, a minimum amount of mathematics for admission. And as a result, uh, it will be, they will be less change in Arizona than in any other state in the country. In every other state in the country, you are dropping at least one assumption, that is a course of geometry at the level of trigonometry or above in mathematics. Uh, at every, in every other public university in the country, uh, at least a third year of, of high school math is required. And, uh, and that means, in effect, uh, you know, the minimum, the minimum amount that, that a student would have for admission would be uh, trigonometry. And it, for many, many, many cases, well beyond that. But not in Arizona. So, Arizona will be affected less than any other state that we're aware of. And for some reason, maybe that's not so surprising, because the main writer of the uh, Common Core happens to be from University of Arizona. So what you're saying is our standards were already lower to go into the university. You could interpret it that way. <laughs> All right, Dr. Milgram, uh, back to you again. Oh, 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 come on now. Are you acquainted with Dr. Craig Barrett, who taught engineering at Stanford University, along with being the co-chair of Achieve, Inc.? He's very involved in Arizona politics and is endowed at Arizona State University. Well, do you know why he would be so pro Common Core and yet support his supporter of higher education? Actually, yes, I do know Craig Barrett. Uh, not through his, his work in, in, at Stanford, although I was aware of it, but because of um, that we should, we, we together have been together in a number of of uh, national forums and, and meetings and things like that. And mostly, we agree in the sense that both of us felt, saw the absolute urgency of getting our students to the point where they could actually go into STEM in an effective way, since STEM is the, is the direction of it, our economic future. Um, and I was really surprised that, that Craig Barrett uh, is such a supporter of Common Core. It wasn't expected. And, and I must say that, that Craig Barrett is a very smart guy. And uh, generally, he's very, very careful. And he knows what he's doing when he makes a decision. So he must have decided that there, there are, are other re 
reasons why he supports it. Uh, I can't, as I've indicated, but that's just me. Thank you, Dr. Stotsky. Thank you for coming tonight. You mentioned five people refused to sign off on Common Core. Who were the other three and where are they from? One of the other three, Dylan William, we heard from, he is at the University of London, and I think he may be he's back in the US. At Rutgers. Okay. He was uh, connected with ETS at the time we had the uh, validation committee meetings. He refused to sign off, as he told me in a follow-up note when I asked him if he were free to tell reasons why. He happens to have a strong math and science first at Oxford, I believe. He has, was educated in England and agreed with Professor Milgram about the weakness of the Common Core standards. The other two we never heard from. I tried to find out from them. One of them is a mathematics education professor at the University of Delaware. Do not know why he did not sign off. And the fifth person was from Australia. Why he was on the panel to begin with? Was the same question. Never heard from him. Do not know why. So those are the five. Thank you. Now this question, I guess, is, is related to that. So 25 members on the uh, Standards Validation Committee, 24 agreed, five disagreed. And the question is this now, because uh, I'm not quite sure what the, the objective is. How does that make the professor's opinion valid? And, and, it, and it doesn't identify which professor, pro professors, and since it isn't, you know, this is me answering that question. If it's an opinion, then all opinions are valid. But, uh, any, any response at all? We probably said this already, and in my opening remarks, I mentioned that I was the only English language arts standards expert, and Professor Milgram was the only mathematician. There were eight other people who are called math experts on Jeb Bush's Foundation for Excellence website, but they all have appointments in an education school. So what does it mean if all the others sign off and the only people who are experts do not sign off. <laughs> what do you feel is the point of this obvious dumbing down with Common Core? Why would the people who created the standards want to dumb down our children? Do you have a spec do you have a, an opinion, an idea? I will take a stab at that, and I think that everybody should take, take a stab at that. Because this goes to the core of the question. I mean, we are arguing one way, other people are arguing one other way. I mean, overall people are not stupid. How, come, how can it be? How can it be that you expect Algebra 1 to define college readiness? I mean, you're not stupid, so why did you say so? There must be a reason. I find two reasons in my mind. One is, I will mention the name, but Mark Tucker for many, many years believed that we have to educate our students to be workers in the workforce, right, right. not necessarily aspire to open-ended liberal education. Well, he just recently published, again, that algebra is plenty sufficient to enroll in community college. And most of our workforce employees should go through community colleges. So that's how it started. Jim Milgram pushed it a bit higher through his rubber rousing after before they stopped his ability to do that. But that's how it started and that's really what drives this side of it. Uh, the second issue is that Conoco was made as a and Sandra Slotsky mentioned that it became replacing the high school graduation. But it's really not about high school graduation, it's about college readiness. So, does every college graduate has to be, a high school graduate has to be college ready? Since when? We don't expect everybody to go to college. Why should they be college ready? They should graduate high school. But it sounds low, so they said this appealing goal. 
But then reality hit. Well, it, obviously not everybody can go to college. We may at most have 70, 75 percent really student that are college ready, but we cannot fail 65 percent of high school students to graduate high school. Well, we have to lower the expectation. We call it college readiness, but it's a dumbed down so-called college readiness because we cannot fail 65 percent of high school students. I would only add that I think there was a component in the group of people finally chosen to develop the standards, whether the idea was there seven years ago when the idea of national standards began to become a little bit clearer in a lot of people's mind as to what they thought was a need for this country to improve the school system. I think those who finally ended up being in the driver's seat, so to speak, of choosing the people, and Gates in particular, and I do not understand his reasons at all myself, since I do not know him, but I think what they call a social justice component right. was a part of it. How do you close the so-called gaps? And if you have lower standards for going to college, and then once you're in college, make sure that the retention rate is kept at a certain level so that they're through. You then have the opportunity to claim that your gaps are closed. This became the overriding concern while I was on the Massachusetts Board of Education. It was not how to raise achievement, but how to close gaps. And those are two different directions. Thank you. Okay, and, and I'll just add one remark to it. There, uh, when, when this is something well worth looking up on your own, uh, the key words here, uh, the, 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 the thing that, the, that this is called, the policy is called in the world of, of, of K-12 education in the education schools is efficiency. So look up efficiency as it refers to education and when you read what it says, you'll see almost the direct plan of what Common Core is designed to do. I want to just add to that conversation for just a second. This, this what I'm holding in my hand is Appendix U, Common Core Documents, Executive Summary, pages 59 and 60. It's attached to our Race to the Top State Grant application. Now this document is uh, basically a short explanation or justification, depending on your point of view, for Common Core, developed by the Council of Chief State School Officers, the National Governors Association, as our distinguished speakers have said. Sorry. And in partnership with Achieve, ACT, and the College Board. Okay? But it says, why is this initiative important? Quote, currently every state has its own set of academic standards, meaning public education students in each state are learning to different levels. There's something wrong with that? I thought K-12 education was a fundamental responsibility of state government. All students must be prepared to compete with not only their American peers in the next state, but with students from around the world. These standards will help prepare students with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed in college and careers and to be prepared to compete globally. Globally, we're going to ship our kids to be part of a workforce in foreign countries, it, it's the camel's nose under the tent. It, it, is a, it is a rationalization for the federalization of K-12 education. You know, the other thing that, that this document says, it just, just checks my hide, pardon my French, it says, what happens after the Common Core Standards are developed? Quote, adoption of the Common Core Standards is voluntary for states. I want to say that again. Adoption of the Common Core Standards is voluntary for states. The document follows this in the appendix to the uh, Race to the Top Grant application is the document, the Memorandum of Agreement signed by Governor Brewer and then Superintendent of Public Instruction Tom Horn. This was, you know, one of the standards. Anybody had ever had any look at the draft standard? But it too says this effort is voluntary for states. And it is fully intended that the states adopting the Common Core Standards may choose to include additional state standards beyond the Common Core Standards. I don't know how anything that on its face is so explicitly voluntary 
became so explicitly mandatory and compulsory. So we're going to hold the feds to their words. We're going to hold these organizations to their words. It's voluntarily. So we're going to voluntarily choose to withdraw. different take on where this is and how it's all evolved. Um, and I think there's two competing things going on here, and uh, partly from my study of the history of the American education system, uh, progressives make no secret about what they're going to do. Never have, never will. A hundred years ago, they changed the way we train our teachers, and they created colleges of education, and they very clearly stated that the goals of that type of teacher training was to change American society. So we have two competing factions, I believe, going on here. An ivory tower of uh, colleges of education who want to use that system to change what our society will be and how it will become. And then on the other hand, there's a group of people that quite frankly want to make a whole lot of money. We have $600 billion to be grabbed in education, and that's why we reform our education system consistently about every uh, six, eight, ten years. Sell more textbooks, sell more programs, sell more this, sell more that, and none of it's in the best interest of our children, and that's why we have to reclaim our education system. This, uh, this next question is for any member on the panel up here uh, that wishes to speak to it. And it goes uh, something like this. Some governors have responded to, uh, uh, to, to Common Core. Who do you think has taken the best approach? And they actually have given you multiple choice questions. Um, a would be Bobby Jindal. B, Mary Fallon. C, Mike Pence. I know this is a favorite of Dr. Stasky's, Mike Pence. Um, and D. Scott Brown. So, all I can tell you is it says Scott Brown here. Scott, well, Scott Brown Walker. <laughs> so, uh, anybody want to take that? Sure, that's easy. That's easy. That's easy. It's uh, that's as easy. I can get that one. It's Scott Walker because he kept Wisconsin out on the Common Core in the first place. Jindal, of course, has had to reverse himself. Oh, he oh, I thought he did. All right, we'll pass, we'll pass the microphone over there. But, okay, okay. I think uh, Mary Ellen in Oklahoma, she did the best game. Because what happens is, most states in the country have no children behind waivers. And they like the waivers. It doesn't give them much more money. It's really the flexibility of the money that they get already. But it's convenient and they can change things, so they like it. Part of the waiver is you have to have so-called college and career ready standards. Why do I say so-called? Because if it's, you're called common core, you are automatically become college, uh, college and career ready, by definition. If you back off, you have to replace it with your own standards, but you have to get your colleges to certify them as college and career ready. So that's the amount of work. You can be done, but you know. When you withdraw, you have a very short time to replace them. You used to have Common Core for the last three, four years. Now you're rushing to uh, committees and seem to finish something in six weeks. It's a crazy race, a foolish race. Don't do it. What Oklahoma did, said very simply, okay, we are out. We fall back on the previous standard, previous test, we don't care. It will now will take our sweet time, a year and a half, two, and we work on it as we should have from day one, rather than accept the fake stuff coming from Washington. Right. So that's the way to do it, not what Pence did. Oh, we'll work it quickly and then we end up with, still do the same thing with the name. Actually, worse. And other people. Thank you. Everyone's you. You shaking their head yes, or they've gone to sleep on the panel. So. Everyone seems to agree with that. Oh, here we go. Why did the NGA create Common Core? 
I think we did this one kind of, but what was their motive? I think we kind of did. Uh, National Government Association, what type? Well, those were the two organizations that were willing to cooperate together, accept Gates money, and sponsor the project, as far as we know. I don't know that there were other organizations that were willing to do this, but I'm not knowledgeable about anymore. There is a sickness when you live in Washington, and it hits you once you settle down there. I was there for less than two years, and I still got sick. <laughs> Basically, it goes like this. Well, I'm here in the center of the universe. Somebody, in the first month, I heard the expression, 25 square miles surrounded by reality. I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, you sit there, and you think, well, I'm here. Clearly, I'm the smartest person around. So how do I go about telling those yokes in the country what to do? Because I know what to do. It's they don't get it. Well, I'm joking with them, the way I'm telling the story. But the point is, you have organizations sitting in Washington for decades. And they are basically clubby places for the governors to chat and dream of some common initiatives, superintendents, dream of the same achieve was scheduled, they started 15, by now 20 years ago almost, to actually pro promote common national standards because there must be centralized because, hey, it has to be us controlling it. Right. You mean there are laws that don't allow the education department to do controlling? Okay, we'll plan on it, call it voluntarily. And sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Achievement, actually interesting project, American Diploma Project for many years, trying to promote voluntary, truly voluntary standards. But then came the crisis. And suddenly they got the stimulus, $800 billion. And the Department of Ed got about $100 billion of them. And about $5 total billion was kind of free. $5 billion of free money, not allocated. Wow, we can do a lot of things with it. And the rest is history. Well, and I was just going to add to that, if you take a step back a little bit further, a couple of years before that, and I think it was um, 2006, 2007, before the National Governors Association got involved, there's a organization, it's uh, Governor Hunt, and it's out of Virginia, Hunt Education Excellence or something like that. I apologize that I don't remember it exactly right now. But basically what they did was they commissioned a study of standards across the nation to create a crisis that then they got Bill Gates involved to solve. And then uh, this question is, how and why were Professors Mugram and Stasky chosen to serve on the validation committee? Okay. Okay. It, it came as a complete surprise to me. Uh, one, it, there, there are uh, most of the members of the validation committee were nominated by the states. Each state in, in, was allowed to nominate one individual uh, to serve on the validation committee. There were a certain number of people like uh, Linda Darling Hammond, who had, was, was uh, Obama's chief education advisor, and she obviously was ex officio on the committee. There were others of that, of that type, but otherwise than that, uh, each state nominated one person. Now, certain states are more important to, uh, well, to uh, the uh, people who are look, the politicians who look at the effect of, uh, of things. And one of the states that's incredibly important is California. Um, so I was nominated by California, but nobody told me. <laughs> if they had told me, there is no way in hell that I would have gone along with. But they didn't tell me. And so all of a sudden I get this letter from the governor saying, you're on the validation committee if you want to be. And at that point, 
I was, I was on the writing committee for the core standards, but I wasn't real happy with the way things were looking. So this, this look, as I told you about the charge of validation, this looked like a much more reasonable way to have some real say in what the standards would look like. And so that's why I was on. I wanted to be on the final committee because I wasn't on either of the other two. And so I kept hounding poor Mitchell Chester, who is the Commissioner of Education in Massachusetts. And I was on the state board and had been on the search committee that hired him, so he owed me a favor. So I kept nagging <laughs> him to put me on the validation committee. Every week he would call up Washington and they were courting Massachusetts because they wanted Massachusetts to abandon its standards and adopt Common Core. And then I would, he would tell me that he had told Washington he wanted me, and I would call him every week to remind him. And then the day before nominations closed, he called and said he finally got me on the committee. And I'm sure he moves the day. <laughs> that was a dream come true for him. <laughs> Now, the, uh, th there's a series of questions here that I think are, are, are really related, so I'm going to uh, read all three of them because I think they kind of get it the same, the same, uh, same idea. Uh, one would be, what are our, our, our rights for opting out of testing and how will that affect our children and their grades? Secondly, how can parents in Arizona opt their children out of the test? Again, what are the impacts of that? And the third one is similar. In the state of Arizona, can students boycott uh, standardized testing? and what are the legal rights, and um, so that's, I think that's being driven a little bit by the, uh, that, uh, that, the, the, yeah, the Glenn Beck thing the other night, so, that's moving. Um, well, you know, we don't know what, uh, what your legal rights are here, um, but what I did do was I, I somebody who was, who shall remain nameless, uh, did a very careful research into the laws in California and created an opt-out form together with a handout explaining the particular uh, laws that needed, that could be quoted if it was necessary. So the legal basis was there and the form was there that parents could easily fill out. And what we're going to do in California is that's going to be incredibly widely distributed and we'll just see where it goes. But you have to, I mean, there obviously be different laws with different numbers on them in, in Arizona, but what I did do was I brought a copy of, of the document I just described, and there, were, there are copies of it out there or otherwise available. People can tell you about that. So uh, that's, that's probably the best and safest way to approach it. Uh, that's, at least that's the best and only way I know. I would only add that the basic right of parents to keep their children from going to school on any particular day has always been there, and they can do it at any time. So they can opt their kid out. They don't have to ask for permission. There are some school committee systems in Massachusetts that have said that students, they have voted as school committees, that parents can opt their kids out because many of these school committee members have children in the schools have opted their own kids out. So they have allowed it. But parents don't need to ask for permission because they do it already. If they want to go on a vacation or the kid's sick, you just keep your kid home and send an excuse. Now, if you want to send your kid to school with a note that says he is not or she is not to take the test, but I want instruction to take place, I don't want the kid put in a closet for the day, that parents can also do because there have been some incidents reported around the country of schools that punished the child who was sent to school but not allowed by the parent to take the test. Parents still have the same rights they have always had. So they should ask for those rights. But the question of the school administering the test when it real one comes along, not the pilot ones, parents can still do what they want and say, I don't want my child to take the test when it is given. The policy of whether there's to be any punishment to the child, for example, that it might be part of their GPA or in some other 
thing that might be done is a school committee policy. And when someone has raised the question about the superintendent setting it, I've said, it's got to be a school board policy. It can't be set by a school superintendent because they're not supposed to be setting policy. So that would have to be looked at carefully if a school official or teacher tried to punish a child or a parent for keeping this. We don't know. These are things to be played out. Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but, um, and we do have great parental rights here in Arizona. Unfortunately, back in 2005, there was a lawsuit that went through the courts in California. It was called Fields v. Palmdale. And basically, it was an argument that parents had with their school district over sex education. And uh, the children were exposed to some information without the parents' knowledge and without their ability to opt out. As these things sometimes happen, they, it spiraled up through the court system and it actually landed in the Ninth Circuit Court. And what they ruled in that court case was that parents lose their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse door. They said a parent has a right to choose their child's school, but once that school is chosen, they lose their constitutional rights. Now, silly me, I always thought our rights came from God and the Constitution protected them, but apparently the Ninth Circuit knows different. Um, from what I said when I went through many law conferences was that this decision was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court refused to hear it. Now, we didn't see a lot of problems with it here in Arizona, um, but we could under Common Core because if a whole bunch of parents come and say, we want to opt our children out of this, um, or a parent comes and says, I want to opt my child out of everything, what, or all the Common Core, what could happen is that school districts could say one of two things. They could say, well, take your child and leave and enroll them in another school. Well, with Common Core being everywhere, where are you going to take your child, number one? And number two, because we tie our um, funding to the number of bodies that sit in a the seat, they're never going to tell you to take your child out of school. But they can also, they will say, sue us, knowing full well that there is this precedent. So in the Ninth Circuit, although we've not seen it pushed and, and um, used too much, it is a threat, I believe, that is out there. So we have to be very careful. We have to work with our legislature to try and improve our parents' rights and make sure that we protect them as best we can. But this is a threat. And it, again, it was Fields v. Palmdale. It's from 2005. Thanks, now as, as I'm just a moderator, but I'm going to weigh in as the, as the Senate president for a second and just talk about it as a state legislator. Um, what we're talking about here, about opting out for parents in, in a protest way, and, and what they, the comment I heard at the Glenn Beck thing was that uh, somebody, one, some of the, one of their policy experts, one of their area experts, said that every state, uh, you, can, you can opt out at every level, but, but we are actually researching this at, the, at the, uh, the State Senate right now because I don't believe that that is the case. I think we may need to have a statutory change um, and it would be following something like Cal what California has where you, where the parent can opt out. I prefer to do something called an opt-in, but, but I'm always the most radical, and that is to say if you really want your kid to take the common court test, you have to opt in. This is kind of and everybody's to do it. But, but that's just me. So, and so I'm just going to make a plug here. That's why you need 17, or we have, we have 17 Republicans in the state Senate. You need 16, 31, and 1 to make that happen. But that means you need 16 senators who will vote for such an idea, 31 representatives that will, and you need a governor who will sign that to make that go in and be willing to fight that. You'll need an attorney general who will be prepared to defend that when that goes to court. That's why elections are so incredibly important. And so that's, now, that's back to the moderating panel. Uh, this one says, I am opposed to the data collection uh, portion of Common Core. How do I help my kids out of the data collection portion? Unfortunately, you really have no choice and uh, no way to opt 
Now, since the FERPA was changed, FERPA was reinterpreted in 2011 at this point, I think, if I remember. And it essentially it took away certain uh, rights of parents of uh, its whole or need for parent permission to pass information. The consortium, uh, TAC and Smart Urbana, both of them signed an agreement with uh, the U.S. Department of Education committing to transfer individual student records to the U.S. Department of Education. Never happened before. And uh, unless you have a state law that was very careful, much not relying on fair but an explicit state law that says you cannot do this and that, and you are not part of the consortium, because the consortium has a backdoor agreement already, but if you take a contractor, directly you have a contract with a contractor, not with this consortium, but as another deal, and you make sure that the data stays within the contractor, because it's your data, just the contractor holds it for the purpose of analysis, uh, reporting, and so on and so forth, then you can do it as a state. But individual parent has no way to prohibit it. Just on that point, that is the loan bill that reached the governor's desk this last session uh, of the six bills dealing with Common Core. And it was to prevent that from happening, the transfer of data. And in fact, we were trying to prevent data collection entirely. But the governor vetoed that bill uh, that was passed. So we have a problem we're going to have to, re we have to uh, make another run at that bill if we can not piece of that legislation. How can I fight Common Core while I am in high school? I'm looking for the youngest person here. <laughs> so this is very, very important because much of the animus against Common Core comes when parents see the samples of work. They see the samples and they go ballistic. They go right in the face and say, that can stand. And that's exactly how we should continue this battle. How do we get this material? Because students share it with their parents and with their parents' friends. Most students, you know, they do their homework, don't bother their parents, parents don't bother them, everybody's happy. No. If the students want to help, collect this kind of annoying examples and bring them home, bring them to your friends, publish it. Bring it to your local newspaper, they will be happy to publish it. <laughs> another aspect, because I was involved uh, over 20 years ago in Brookline at a time when there was a controversy with the social studies department and the high school students, what was at issue was the survival of an AP European history course. To get to the end of this story, which was very complicated and it lasted, it lasted for several years, the high school students who wanted that course found that there was a state law that said that if X number of high school students signed a petition for a course, the school committee would have to allow them to have the course, and that is what they did. Now, I don't know whether there are similar statutes like that elsewhere, but students are supposed to be taught about civic participation, and this is an avenue for high school students for, say, a math course that might not be there, or a good high school English course in grade 11 and 12 that would be more demanding from Common Core. And if it's possible for students to sign a petition, which they did, and they contacted the Attorney General's office, they were very successful and the school committee just folded because the students were there asking for it, not their parents. One thing about what you both said is there has been a lot of uh, uh, publicity generated when parents see the, the work that's been called upon. I'll just relate to, to you that um, a lot of the times as, in post-secondary ed, uh, there are actually, uh, in, through social media, you have a lot of students in universities who are, quite frankly, they're, they're surreptitiously videotaping some of their instructors, they're bringing the, the documents that they're being uh, asked to review, and as soon as they begin publishing that, all of a sudden there's a retrenchment coming from some of these professors because there's an embarrassment and because there's public outrage and what you, what you see going on in the universities as well. So that type of organization or organized effort could also be used here. 
Here's one. If you could only make one recommendation to the average citizen to stop or change Common Core, what would it be? You only get one. Frank, uh, Frank wants to say, say, uh, I, I whispered to, uh, to Andy, get involved in politics. You know, joking aside, folks, elections have very real consequences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, as a former United States Congressman, politics drives policy. And I don't think I'd get any argument from Andy or Judy, uh, anyone that's served in elective office. The good news is, it almost goes to, you know, what can, what can I, I, I think what I'm hearing is what can the average citizen do, or you can certainly get involved in our political process, you're doing that by being here tonight, because we've covered both policy and we've gotten into the political realm as well. But there's a move afoot across this state and across this land. You know, you heard about the soccer moms a few years ago? Well, look out because the Common Core moms are coming to a new field in and that's just legitimate, if that's a bottom-up grassroots movement, it's powerful. So, Mike, if you can do one thing, one thing only, make your voice heard, make your vote count in this election. Early voting has started by mail ballot, and we'll continue up to the primary election day. And hopefully make, you know, smart decisions, uh, and put people there that will work with Andy as the Senate President, get to that governing majority that we need in the state legislature to be able to address these concerns, to be able to empower and entrust parents again. The first most important lifelong teacher, that the empowerment and, tr and the trust in parents, of course, the whole education system should be based on that. So we want to put the parents back in charge, like I said earlier, and we want to reclaim our legitimate state government responsibility for the education of our kids by listening to parents and empowering them. But for the most part, the only time parents came to the board meeting in large numbers was if we threatened to cut extracurricular activities or if their student, their child was getting recognized before the board. And then they would come and they would sit for our recognition and then they would walk out and the boardroom was filled with nothing but administrators and employees. What you need to do, and I don't blame people with Common Core because they worked very hard to keep this a secret from all of us for a very long time. They got a three, at least a three year head start on us, really more than that. But there are so many other things that happen and what you need to do is go to those school board meetings. I know it's hard, I know we all have busy lives, but this is our children that we're talking about. And when those school board members don't do what you elected them to do, you need to get in their face and either tell them, I'm going to find someone to run against you or I'm going to do it myself because you represent us. This is for anyone on the panel. Have any of you had K-12 teaching experience? I taught third grade many years ago two years and I taught at the high school level, French and German. Do, do any of the speakers understand Arizona's unique challenge teaching at-risk students? You know, I, you know I, get, I get pretty wonkish on this particular subject because, you know, I, this all began, to be honest with you, because I, I'll kind of put on more of a nonpartisan hat for a moment. This, this really all started under Bush 43. This idea of no child left behind, the idea that we're going to test every kid every year in the core academic subjects to determine whether or not they're making AYP, annual year of the progress. And in schools and school districts where a significant percentage of kids aren't making AYP, then we're going to consider some sort of sanctions against them. In other words, it, it, this is all again top down, federal government imposed on state government, state government in turn on district and charter schools. The, the, there's nothing wrong though with high standards, I want to make that clear, provided that they're designed by Arizonans for Arizona students. But this idea of high stakes testing, that's a whole nother ballgame. And I have people come up to me all the time and say, but Frank, how are we going to know how our kids are doing compared to their peers in other states? If you go into the race to the top grant application, the baseline measurements are all based on the name. 
The NAEP test results, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, nicknamed the nation's report card. We've been giving that for years and years and years because you see, if we take, to the question Andy asked, if we take a lot of funding as we do as a state for low-income students, students that come from families or households that qualify for the federal free or reduced price lunch program, the trade-off for that is we have to administer the NAEP every two years to represent a sampling of kids in the fourth and eighth grades in the subjects of reading and math. There's other NAEP tests that can be added, but at a minimum, in reading and math. So there's already a national test. But if we're really going to go down this path, we're going to test every kid, and, and then we're not only going to aggregate the test scores at the school level, the district level, the state level, but we're going to break them out for what they call the disaggregated student populations. These are the more difficult to educate segments of the student population. Then we clearly see the, the, the heavy lifting, the hard work we have to do as Arizonans. Because we do have a significant number of students that come from low-income families, families living at or below the poverty level, under that, under that particular program I described, Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We have lots of kids that have learning disabilities and have an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan. We have, and, and they're all, by the way, tested on the same test, which makes no sense. Because we're Arizona, we have a significant population of students with limited English proficiency, what we would call English language learners or English second language students. And we also have real challenges with Native American schools uh, and students in, on, our, on our tribal reservations, tribal nations. So if we're really going to get serious and say, okay, look, where is the achievement gap? Well, the achievement gap is with those more difficult to educate segments of the student population. They're the ones that are lagging significantly behind, not behind peer and grade level. And if we want to improve test scores on the part of those students and test scores as a whole, as a state, we really have to focus intensively on those student populations and trying to get them the remedial and intensive help that they need to, to be able to close that achievement gap so they, and bring them up to peer and grade level. It's a huge challenge. And that's really where our resources need to go and not into common core standards and testing. I mean, don't go too far. Uh, this is a question for Frank, and it's actually, there's, uh, there's three related uh, expressions of this. And so let me, let me get this. It says, explain exactly how you will receive Common Core on day one if elected governor, and is that really possible? This one says, the memorandum of agreement commits Arizona to a process that will lead to adoption of standards. Adoption of Common Core was done by the State Board of Education per its authority under the State Constitution of the ARS 15203. State board's action can only be reversed by the board or by legislative action. Uh, why do you think a new governor can repeal that, uh, uh, repeal the Common Core by tearing up the memorandum? And then the other one is, can the Common Core be stopped by an executive order of the governor? If not, why not? That's Thank you, Andy. I'd actually prefer that the uh, State Senate President ask, answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just an interesting side note on this. Did, did you notice that a few weeks ago that the governor, the superintendent of public instruction, who I very much hope is on his way out, and the State Board of Education decided to withdraw Arizona from the Park Consortium? Did you see that? That's just a fig leaf, right? right. Because, because they're going to turn right around. Park got a huge head start by being able to field test our, our kids for quite some time. So they have the inside track. If we go down this path of getting the, the, the primary statewide assessment, but it was done like that. Governor, superintendent, state board. So I just want to be very explicit about this, and I want to be very explicit to Ken, because I know the question. He's got a question on his mind as well. Look, folks, I'm ready to do the job on day one. I'm going to start in that transition period, hopefully working with Diane as the state superintendent of public instruction, but I'm going to make clear that I expect the resignation of members of the State Board of Education who voted to adopt Common Core, and I'm going to have appointments ready to go on day one, ready to send to Andy as the State Senate President for their review and consideration because they have they have the confirmation power. We're going to have every all our ducks in a row so that we can do this and get it done just as the players, governor, superintendent, state board decide to withdraw from PARC, the PARC consortium, in order that, that it look more objective when PARC gets the actual test contract. So, but, but I want to go on because, in, in thanks to Anita Christie on this, because I, I, this is from another blog by Mercedes Schneider. I don't know if any of your panelists know They do. Or not even. And Diane knows EduBlog. Uh, exiting the Common Core Memorandum of, of Understanding. Now it's called 
She calls it the memorandum of understanding. The actual document says memorandum of agreement. She points out that the document includes no provision for exiting Common Core. It also include, includes no wording in which states are bound to Common Core if the original signatories no longer hold the positions of governor and state education superintendent. And you know why I think that is? Because as I read a few mo moments ago to you, the document says that the standards are intended to be voluntary. Right? It's right in the document. I'm not making it up. I quoted that exactly. It says, since the Common Core agreement fails to include language binding states, if such states receive race to the top money, the, the grant, right, no doubt excluded, so that the U.S. Department of Education might maintain that it is not forcing states to accept Common Core in order to receive race to the top grant money, but in fact that's exactly what's happening, it's a quid pro quo, that she concludes that if Common Core is truly not federally enforced, then it will not, then the, then the feds will not pursue states choosing to be state-led right out of Common Core and the memorandum, memorandum of agreement. So I, I'm pretty confident that, you know, I've, <laughs> I've got a pretty extensive business background, many, many years. As I mentioned, I'm a former United States Congressman. I chaired the House of Representatives Education Subcommittee. I'm pretty confident in my ability to interpret documents and the memorandum of agreement is in fact a contract document. Now the governor, the go outgoing governor, Governor Brewer, her, obviously the power, her power, ends the day she leaves office and she has no power to then bind her successor. And I as the incoming governor have e half the power and can use the executive, legitimate executive authority of the office to rescind her signature. And by the governor withdrawing, and again I hope it's in tandem with Diane as the state superintendent, by us withdrawing, effectively rescinding the signature of our predecessors, the contract, the document is invalidated. But again, I'm not gonna wait until, I'm gonna, we're gonna make, have all our ducks lined up in a row, and I wanna be very emphatic with you, okay? If, if you want a, someone in the office that'll just tinker around the edges, make token changes, don't vote for me. Vote for someone else. But if you want a true warrior, Someone who will do just as I'm saying today, knowing full well and expecting you to hold me accountable for what I've said here tonight, I would very much appreciate it and be honored by your support and your vote. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that has to be the last question due to our time constraints. I want to again thank Jennifer Reynolds and her organization who worked so hard to put this on. Ken Bennett, uh, Judy Burgess also here. I want to thank our distinguished panel. They've come from a long way. They've been working on this. And I thank each of you for being here, taking time out of your schedule to be here tonight, making arrangements to be here. So thank you. Thanks for your